Thank you for listening to this week's message from New Tribe Church. We hope you are both inspired and encouraged. To stay connected with us throughout your week, be sure to visit our website, download our app, or find us on Facebook and Instagram simply by searching for New Tribe Church. Now, open your hearts to hear and receive all that God has in store for you. Yes, but how many of you have been encouraged by this series, Lean In? Anybody? Just say that to your neighbor. Say, lean in. And we started this series with the reality of, of where we are in, in our world and, and kind of what's coming up, the election season and, and, and all of the, the unrest that's happening in our nation right now, in our world. But how many of you know when we just lean in to what God has for us, there's no season, there's no tribulation, there's no trial that we cannot endure. Amen. And so we're in part four today. Uh, we've looked at week one. We talked about leaning into the grace of God. How many are thankful for God's grace? I know we, we need extra grace. We need more grace. We talked about trusting, leaning in, trusting him, not leaning on our own understanding. Last week, Pastor Mike talked about money. Come on, somebody. We need to lean in. And you see how we've set that up? Grace, trust, and then money, right? Because we wanted to make sure that we did that in a biblical way. And today I thought, well, if we're going to lean in right now, I want to talk about the rapture. I want to talk about the rapture of the church. And I want to say this out of the gate, that this is something we can lean into. And here's what I mean when I say that, that our hope is in the rapture. Now, some of you are nodding your heads and you kind of hear where I'm going with that. In other words, you're thinking, where, you know, what in the world are we going to be talking about today? Well, we're going to unpack this today when we're talking about the rapture. We're talking about a, a field of study or, or a line of study that has to do with eschatology, the, which is from a Greek word which has to do with the end times or the, the last days concerning those things that are coming last. When the, the faithful, okay, the rapture, when the faithful will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air and, and we'll be with him forever. And uh, I want to say that there are many different views on eschatology. There are many different opinions on the last times. I'm going to share with you the true one today and everyone else is, well, I don't know what they're teaching. So, um, <clears throat> no, you'll, you'll actually find that, that in the study of eschatology, what we're dealing with is a non-essential doctrine. And this is important to understand in Christian study and theology, you have essential doctrines and you have non-essential doctrines. The doctrines. It basically what that means, it doesn't mean that it's not important or that it's not critical. Uh, it simply means this. In essential doctrines, we have unity, right? The, 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 the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As a, as a follower of Jesus, that is an essential doctrine, amen? Like the atonement of sin, right? That, that, that Jesus alone can forgive our sin. That we're saved by grace, right? So the doctrine of salvation, the virgin birth of Christ. These are essential doctrines that uh, we can't compromise these. As we follow Jesus, this is the gospel. And if you teach any other gospel, then it's an untrue gospel or a false gospel. Non-essential doctrines are those uh, that we have liberty in. Maybe I can just say it this way. In essential doctrines, we have unity. And in non-essential doctrines, we have liberty. Right? So that means that there may be different views. Now, God said himself in more places than one, it's not for you to know the times or the day. So it would be silly, wouldn't it, to break fellowship if someone had a different eschatological view than you did. You guys see what I'm saying? Because Jesus said, you don't know. So if anyone who claims to know and put God in the box and say it's going to happen on this day, at this time, at this hour, is actually doing something that God said, you're not actually able to do that. Because he said, you can't know the days and the time. So uh, we're going to look today at, at the rapture. All right? We're going to look at who goes and who does not go? We're based on what the Bible is speaking for itself, the, the rapture being, being joined with Jesus in the heavens forever. How many are excited about this day, right? Be honest, how many it freaks you out a little bit? I know that you think about these kind of things, especially as you see the world and the turmoil that it is. Uh, but who goes? Who doesn't go? Do, do, do pets go, right? Are, are there, are, do all dogs go to heaven, right? And I Actually, I don't know the answer to that. I hope that not all pets go, or we're going to have a couple of hamsters, some lizards that we're going to be re reunited with, right? In the Anyway, um, our, our youngest son, when he was a toddler, no joke, he said this after church one day. I guess they were studying in the book of Isaiah, 
and, and we had this cat named Jinxie. Jinxie was a stray cat that we adopted. It's a really cute little cat. And, and uh, one day he discovered Jinxie dead in the kitchen. That's pretty traumatic, right? And so we, uh, we walked through that and he asked, Daddy, will Jinxie be in heaven? Now, I was at seminary at this time in my life, and, and so I was pretty smart, you know, as most seminary guys are. And, and so I looked at my toddler, and I said, son, I don't think so. And, and he said, but the lion will lie down with the lamb, which he was referencing Isaiah 11, which talks about jackals and wolves lying down with lambs in the new kingdom and new heaven and new earth. And I was like, here he is preaching about the millennial kingdom reign of Christ, and here I'm in seminary. He's preaching me up already, like... You know, so I don't know, will there be pets there? I don't know who's going to go, who's not going to go. Like I said, there are several eschatological views regarding the rapture. So what we're going to do today is, if you got a Bible, you can follow along, you can write these down. There's a lot of references, okay? There's nothing unique about this teaching in the sense that you can't find this teaching somewhere else. You can't find it more in depth and way better than what I could do today. But what I want to do is simply this, because I believe that the Bible is God's word. How many of you amen that? Because if it's not, we're just really wasting our time here, right? We might as well be getting together, singing some songs, and then studying Dr. Seuss books. I mean, it, it really, either it is the Word of God or it is not. So when we allow the Bible to speak for itself, God sheds light on, on what He is doing and what He will do. So this is why I believe this is important to talk about. I believe today that you're going to find great comfort, you're going to find great rest regarding the last days and the end times and God's plan for the rapture of his church. Amen, somebody? I, I, just let me pray for us right here. Father, we love you. We thank you for a time to come together as your sons and daughters to learn to receive all that you have for us, Jesus, today. So we ask, Holy Spirit, through this word, that you would bring comfort and encouragement to our hearts, that we would find soul rest as we hear and we are transformed by your truth, in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. amen. All right, so, so what is the rapture of the church, all right? And why should we talk about it? We're gonna start in 1 Thessalonians chapter four, 1 Thessalonians chapter four, and, and here's what the apostle Paul is writing to the church. He said, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. So why are we talking about this right here? This is not a topic we should be ignorant on. We should have some idea even though we can't know all things. I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who have, have died before us, right? Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring hit with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Let me pause right here and say this. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. The Apostle Paul is talking about a generation of people who will not die. Now, how many would you like to be a part of that generation? You never have a funeral. You never experience death. There's never any mourning for the loss of your life. You are here. Jesus returns. That's what he's talking about. There are those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Somebody shout. All right, so that was pretty good. So it's going to be obvious, all right? It's not going to be like, did it happen? Did it not happen? The, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And what this is talking about, is, the Scripture's clear on this. When someone has a relationship with Jesus, and they pass from this, this life to the next life, it says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Your body, your physical, even if, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how you're buried or, or whatever the, the situation is, your bodily remains here on the earth, but when that loud shout happens and that trumpet is blown and Jesus returns for the rapture of his church, there will be a, a union with the body and the soul. And if you're still alive and you've never had a funeral, when that happens, body and soul are immediately met up with Jesus in the sky. All right, let's unpack this. So then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Now that word caught up means harpazo, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Basically, it means to be snatched away immediately. They will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Well, that sounds like a big, exciting day, doesn't it? Now, thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. 
So this teaching is supposed to bring comfort. And I, I, wanna, I wanna say this, I wanna preface our, our sermon today on the rapture of saying that, that I am not a real big fan of sensationalizing the Bible in order to elicit an emotion that drives fear into others' hearts so that they make a decision, right? I, I'm, I'm not opposed to that necessarily. I wouldn't, I wouldn't stand up and leave if I felt like that was being done. I'm just saying I'm not particularly for that way of presenting the rapture. Why? Because the Bible says comfort one another with these words. I'm looking forward to the big let's all meet up in the sky, right? And so let's look at this word. It says we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds. The, the word there is harpazo. And it's to seize, it is to catch up, it is to snatch away. That's the Greek word. In the Latin translation is the word rapturo. Now that's where you get the concept of the rapture. So if you start looking for the word the rapture in your Bible, you're not gonna find it, right? So it's a concept, it's a teaching, it's a label that's, that's found in the transliteration of the original text. So harpazo, to, to seize up, to catch up, to snatch away in the Latin rapturo. Here, the idea would be similar to the way that a fireman rushes into the burning bedroom of a child and, and immediately just snatches that child from danger. That's the idea. That's the picture. So it is a fast, uh, immediate, you're taken from one place to another. Now, now Jesus spoke very uh, openly and not more than once about a coming great tribulation, a period on the earth of great torment in the last days. But watch this. Here's the plan for the church regarding that time. These are red letters. This is Revelation 3.10. Watch this. And Jesus said, since you, he's talking to the church, those who are faithful in Christ, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So, so my, my eschatological view to share with you today regarding the rapture is this, is that a couple of things. One, I, I believe that we are living in the last hour of the last days. Now you don't have to believe that, but that's, that's my position. Again, this is not essential, right? It doesn't matter. I can't tell you when, I can't, I can't nail down a time, that's not the point. Uh, but, but I just sense that this generation could be the generation that does not die. That is caught up to now. Now, don't everybody breathe. Everybody, everybody just breathe, right? Comfort one another with these words, right? <laughs> I was running on the treadmill and I was studying this. And I knew when I got to this part, it was going to be heavy. So just, I wrote here, just everybody breathe, right? <sighs> Comfort one another. Comfort one another. This could be the generation. This could be the generation that those who are alive in Christ uh, could be taken at any moment. I mean, just in, in, in an immediate just a glimpse of time, flash of time, we're gonna unpack that in a minute. But when it happens, how fast will it happen? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 50. Here's what it says. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. So behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, right? So there's a generation that simply will not die. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. So those who have gone before us in Christ are in the grave. They're gonna be raised and a glorious body is gonna reunite with their soul. And then we also shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Now I wanna key in on that word here. We will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of of an eye. The Greek word there is a tamos. And here's what it means. It, it means like an uncut, an, an indivisible amount of time. It is so fast that it's, you're, you're actually unable to divide it. It's too small to be measured, like a split second. Like if I were to count to you 1,001, 1,002, you, you take about one millionth of that and that's, that's a tamos. That's how, so when the rapture occurs, how fast, will, how fast will it all happen? It will happen in a Thomas. It will happen in a twinkling of an eye. We will be changed in a moment. Somebody gets a shout today. Come on. I, like, and if you're still freaking out about this, comfort one another with this. Right? It's going to be okay. Jesus said it this way. Watch. Luke 17. He said, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. Now let me pause here and say this, because we're gonna talk about uh, God's grace in those 
who are not a part of the rapture. A lot of us have a theology that works like this. We're here now. Jesus has already come once. He ascended. He's with the Father, and he sent the Holy Spirit. He's going to come one more time. That's actually not what the Bible teaches. Uh, one of those days, though, is going to be the rapture. And he taught on this. He goes, there's going to be a time coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. One of the reasons I believe that this generation could be that generation is because I, I sense and I feel in the local body that there's a longing to see Jesus return. And we see what's happening. And, and, and there's something in our spirit that says this isn't right. How long can this go on? How, how bad will it get? And so he says there's going to be a day and you're going to long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. Well, he goes on to say, this is really interesting, and I have time to unpack it all day. He goes, but don't listen to him when they're saying, there he is, or here he comes, or at this hour he'll be here, because you're not going to know. He said, but here, here's how you'll know when it's time. We talked about how fast it will happen, how obvious it will happen. Listen to this. He says, for as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. So you're going to hear it. You're going to see it. You're going to know it. It's, it's going to happen in, in a Thomas. It's going to happen in a split second, and we are going to be with Jesus forever. He goes on to say, but first, the Son of Man, referring to himself, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation, just as it was in the days of Noah. Now, now track with me here. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, drinking. They were marrying. They were just going on with their life, Right? until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. People are just going to be going about their lives, and all of a sudden, Jesus is on the scene. One of the days of the Son of Man. On that day, let those who are on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you that in that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. So what is happening right here? In one of the days of the coming Son of Man, he will, he will show up, and it doesn't matter where you are, who you're with, Jesus knows who belongs to him. And when he shows up, no matter where you are in that time or what you're doing, what if you're in the bathroom at that time? Well, I hope everything is cleaned up and you're ready to go. It doesn't matter in a, in a, in a twinkling of an eye. <laughs> I had this picture all week of just doing like some random chore. It's like, boop, boop, and then you're just gone, right? It's like, before you have a, a time to process it. Now, a little comic relief there. Jesus is very clear on this. Some will be left behind. Now, there's been books written on this and movies and things like that. And again, dramatizing scripture. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it helps us have visuals and things like that. But this is where that comes from. This is very clear. So, so there is this great, you know, meet up in the sky for those who are faithful, but there are those who are left behind, those who do not belong to Jesus. There will be a shout, a trumpet with a sound, and as clear as you can see, lightning strike from the west to the east, the east to the west. In a moment, those who belong to Jesus will suddenly be caught up and will be with him forever. Now, look at this. So what about the whole meeting up in the sky thing? Because that's kind of debated in eschatology. Luke 17, 37. And they answered and said to Jesus, well, where, Lord? Like, where, where are they going to go? They called up. And, and Jesus said to them, this is the New King James Version, wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. So he's saying they're going to be up in the sky. So when you just let the Bible speak for itself, okay, concerning the rapture, Jesus affirmed himself how this is going to happen and, and, and what God's plan is for the church. And we can comfort one another in this. Let me tell you right now, with all the unrest that's going on in our world right now, soul rest is going to be found in the one in whom your soul has rest. And that's the only way to have peace, to be beyond anxiety, to move beyond worry. 
and not fear, I don't have to be in fear of how bad things will get or what may happen or what may not happen. Because I know that when he returns, that my soul will be with him and my body will be with him forever. Here's what I'm trying to say. We don't have to live in fear of how bad things are going to get on the earth. Because suddenly, again, 1 Thessalonians 4, watch, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, snatched out of here like a fireman running into a burning building, immediately taken away to meet with the faithful in Jesus in the air, and we will always be with the Lord. So we comfort, somebody say comfort. So we comfort one another with these words. Okay, so this is the rapture. Everybody good? All right, take a breath. We're, all, we're getting through this. So this is how it'll happen, all right? When will this happen? We don't know the day or the hour, but we do know this. According to Jesus, this rapture, one of the days of the coming Son of Man, this will happen before that great and terrible day of tribulation. Now, some, have, some have taught and some have uh, gone down a path that, no, we're going to live here during the tribulation. Now, what I want to show you now is I just, again, uh, they may make a case for that, and, and it, might, it might be very clear, but how many want to be here for the tribulation? <laughs> Does it sound like a loving father to leave his children in a burning building? Absolutely not. And so I want to show you now is that this is God's plan for the church. This is why we can have soul rest. So no matter how bad it's getting, and people who are like, this is the tribulation. We're in the tribulation right now. I was like, no, we're not. And they're like, well, how do you know? I was like, because I wouldn't be here. <laughs> now, another pastor may preach that differently, but I'm going to stick on that right there because Jesus said, you know, hey, I'm going to come and you're going to be caught up with me. So, all right, let's, let's jump back in here. I hope this is helping somebody. So Jesus said, I'm going to keep you from that great hour of trial. We looked at that, right? Jesus made it clear. The father has no intention of leaving his sons and daughters here to endure his wrath. How can you be so sure? Let's just review a couple of things. It was real simple. Jesus said, just as it was in the days of Noah, just as it was in the days of Lot, Noah and his family, Lot and his family were spared when? Before or after God's judgment? Before. For Noah, the doors were shut up. For Lot, angels called him out and said, we cannot judge this city until you are out of here. We need to get you out of here. The answer is before. They were caught up, called out before the wrath of God was revealed. And so just as God received Noah and his family, Lot and his family to himself before the judgment, Jesus will receive the church, come on somebody, the body of Christ before the great and terrible day of tribulation. Why? Because he loves you and because you've chose to be faithful and to endure and to overcome temptation and to push away the worldly things and say, you know what? I see all this happening. It'd be good just to fall into this lifestyle or to do this or to reject Jesus. But he sees you. He sees that you've chosen him, that you've remained faithful in him. And so when that great and terrible day of tribulation comes, he goes, you're coming with me and I'll handle everything else that's on the earth. And we should find comfort in that. Look again, Luke 17. One will be taken and the other left. The, the Greek word will be taken is paralambano, and, and it means to receive one to oneself. So, so to, to receive to oneself, paralambano. One will be left, one will be taken. Look at John 14. Jesus said, so let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Para Lombano. I'm going to take you and receive you to myself. By the way, um, only because I have listened to a lot of sermons, I've taken a lot of notes, I've discovered that Para Lombano, we're actually talking about a, a Jewish tradition here, okay, which is the groom when he knows he is betrothed to his bride, he will go away for a year in Paralambano. He will go and prepare a place to receive his bride to himself. Isn't that cool? And this is pretty awesome. So if, if, if in a, that Jewish tradition, if a groom would go away for a year to prepare a place to receive his bride unto himself, and he would do that for a year, where has Jesus been this whole time? He's been preparing a place for you in eternity. Let me tell you, Jesus has an amazing place for you in eternity. Come on, this is good stuff. Comfort one another with these things. He's thinking about us. He's, he's waiting to, to, to bring us into himself. Why? He goes, because I want you to be where I am. And so I'll come and receive you to myself. 
So how, how many want to be taken up to Christ himself, right? Uh, how, how many want to stay here in the tribulation and just take a gamble and see what happens, right? Probably, are you being convinced a little bit more that, okay, all right, Jesus is coming. One of the days of the coming Son of Man, he's going to appear. There's going to be a sound. There's going to be a trumpet like lightning, and you're going to be caught up to meet him. And then there are going to be some of those who are left behind. But the good news is that we don't have to live with that troubled heart, like you said. We can have peace. I was thinking about everything that has happened in 2020. I mean, how many of you are over 2020? You know? You know what I'm saying? This New Year's is going to be crazy. People are going to do crazy, stupid stuff, right? Because they're going to be so happy. They're going to be so happy that 2020 is over. It's going to be the wildest New Year we've ever experienced on this planet. Don't forget about Jesus, right? He might come back like, don't party too hard. All right, so... He actually says that. That's my paraphrase. He's like, don't party too hard. Stay prayerful and watchful. I'm coming soon. He actually says that. That's my paraphrase. So um, <laughs> we can have peace about everything that's going on right now. 2020 has been a crazy year. Listen, I, I, I know that you're, you're kind of watching what's happening with all of the, uh, the political stuff right now. What may happen if this person gets elected or this person gets elected? Can I tell you, no matter how bad it gets, as a believer in Jesus Christ, what I'm teaching you today, according to Jesus and his word, that you will not be here when the great and terrible day of tribulation comes. So we can stay watchful, we can stay prayerful and hopeful no matter what comes because even if it looks like hell is advancing, Jesus said he's building his church and he's gonna continue to build his church until he comes and takes his church to meet with him in the sky. So, so he's, he's going to prepare a place for you. That, that, that we, we heard mansions, and there was old songs about mansions. The word there, money, is just say, an abiding, an abode. I just thought I would throw this in there. It's a dwelling place, right? So someone really knows. It could be a tiny home, a log cabin. I, it could be something very small. But I can promise you this, that you will not care about the square footage because you will not be here. You will be with him there. You know, I don't know what he's preparing for us. I, we have battled and battled. We, we replaced an HVAC at our home. Two summers ago, we have replaced it and fixed parts on it for three different times. Just last week, we lost our HVAC. We were, it was that, remember how humid it was last week? So sweltering heat, humidity. And I was just like, I don't know how big the mansion in heaven is. I don't care if it's a tiny home, but at least, God, let there be a window unit blowing cold air into my living room because this is not heaven on earth. What we experienced last week, it was, it was misery. <laughs> All right, we've covered some good news concerning the rapture of the church before the tribulation. Come on, turn to somebody and say, take comfort. Take comfort. Come on, let's comfort one another. I want to say this, just a quick word to parents. Again, the, these are teachings that I've received over time, and I've weighed these with Scripture and what, and what I know, and I find this to actually be very plausible. Will my children be taken up into the rapture to heaven? I actually believe they will. I believe your faith, okay, as a parent, covers your child's faith until about the age of 12 or 13. Now, some teach, you know, about the age of accountability and all that. Some of you, have you heard the age of accountability? You've heard something like this in your tradition or whatever. So I've heard, I've heard that before. I never knew where it came from, though. But here's why. Jesus was bar mitzvahed at around the age of 12 or 13. Depending on the, the Jewish tradition or the rabbinic teachings, that would he have mostly close aligned with. And in, in that Jewish tradition, turning 13, bats mitzvah for a girl, bar mitzvah for a boy, would be the, the legal age of that Jewish tradition where you're considered an adult. You're responsible, you're accountable for your own decisions. So I think it's very plausible to say that as a parent, your faith covers your children to about the age of 12 or 13, which is why, parents, we should really buy into the promise which says what? Raise your children in the way they should go, and when they are older, they will not turn from it. That's a promise, by the way. Amen, somebody? Because some of you have children, and, and, and we can relate, that have turned away, but let me tell you, there's a promise. Come on, somebody, there's a promise that the prodigals will come home, that the waywards will turn and know the, what they were taught and what they have received and what they know. This is a beautiful thing about, about the father too, though, concerning children in the rapture in heaven. Every aborted baby is in heaven right now. now I would go a little bit further. There are no children that are not in heaven. Heaven is full of children. Watch this. Hell doesn't have any children. Does that sound like a loving father? Come on, we serve a good and gracious God. 
And his word is consistent, amen. We can count on it from beginning to end. So we serve a glorious and loving God. So, so what about those who are uh, left behind during the tribulation, right? If we serve a loving God, what about those who are left behind? Jesus comes, there's gonna be a rapture. He's gonna come, why? He says, I'm gonna save you from that great hour, that great trial that is to come. I'm gonna take you with me, but one will be left behind. What happens to those? Watch how amazing and gracious God is. Watch this. Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, I'm not gonna speculate by how long that tribulation is. If you wanna go read Daniel, put all together, talk about seven days and all this kind of stuff and kings and fours and horns and all this kind of crazy stuff. Wah! I'm not going there today. All I'm saying is that after, those, after that tribulation, here's what Jesus said. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. The, the earth is being judged. And then the sign of the son of man will appear in heaven. And you say, well, I thought he already came for the rapture. Remember he said, one of the days of the coming of the son of man. Here's another one. The sign of the son of man will appear after the tribulation in heaven and all the tribes on the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And watch this, he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, I don't know if you caught that there in the last couple of sentences though, is that when he comes again, after having taken his church with him after this tribulation, he's going to collect the elect. That's the church. This, this, this is what that means. During the tribulation, let me just say, when one is left behind and someone is suddenly taken, that's going to cause some questions to be asked in your heart. So though they have not made a decision to that point to receive Jesus in that tribulation, there won't be just one. There will be multiple deci decisions for people to get saved. They're going to be there when he comes back again. In fact, I think, I think that during the tribulation, two things are going to be happening. There's going to be great torment on the earth. But there's also going to be great, great awakening revival on the earth. I won't be here for it, but those who did not receive Jesus will be here. <laughs> this is the goodness of God, amen? He is not like, okay, game over, boom, it's over. That's not what Jesus teaches. I'm coming to get the faithful, and there's going to be tribulation that follows that. And during that tribulation, I'm going to send out my angels. The gospel is going to be preached. There's going to be awakening on the earth. And watch this. Even in that last hour, look at Revelations 14, 6 through 7. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Here it is again. So in the tribulation, any of those who are left behind, there's an opportunity to receive Jesus, an opportunity to be a part of awakening on the earth. But in that end of that tribulation, when it's, when it's finally done, if even at that tribulation they had not made a decision. The Bible actually says that there will be those, when the pestilence comes and the plague comes and the economy crashes, that they will shake their fist, of, fist at God and say, how could you let this happen? And there'll be others who will turn and they will repent. Watch this. He said in a loud voice, this angel, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of the water. This is literally the last call. That is a good and gracious God. This gospel is going to the ends of the earth right now as we speak. We have an opportunity to put our faith in Jesus and to have comfort. No matter what happens or how bad things get, we know that before the great and terrible day of tribulation that he's going to rapture his church to be with him forever. And even if you've got family members or friends who were left behind in that time, let me tell you right yet, you're gonna be joined up with that great cloud of witnesses in the sky. They will still have time on this earth to make Jesus their Lord and Savior. And they could be part of one of the biggest revivals ever to happen on the face of this earth. And even after that, if there's one left, an angel comes proclaiming the gospel. Now, I feel like I can do a pretty good job of preaching the gospel, but an angel preaching the gospel is like, okay, now I'm going to do it. What does it say? Every tongue will confess, right? Every knee will bow. I think that's what's going on right here. The last opportunity. Come on, we serve a gracious and loving God. So the goodness of God is that even at the end of tribulation before God's final judgment, when the heavens and the earth will pass away, that even then those who will remain will have that opportunity to be with Jesus forever. So there's this rapture prior to tribulation. There's a second rapture after tribulation. And you can choose what you want to believe about either one of those timelines. But can I say this? Again, the timeline is not essential. So when is this going to happen? I don't know. It could happen right now. The timeline is not essential. Here's what's essential, and here's what is clear. Jesus wants us to be with him forever, and he wants to deliver us from his wrath to come. 
Is that message clear today in this, in this sermon? Look at 1 Thessalonians 1. Here's our God. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Let me tell you, Jesus does not want you to be here when his wrath comes. 1 Thessalonians 5, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. Can I get a shout right there? But to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, I, I just, I just want to say this. I know we're living in a time, Jennifer and I talk about this often, about hanging out with, you know, with friends who don't know Jesus. And uh, you can skirt around topics like politics and things like that, but when you just throw the name Jesus down, they just kind of go, I'm looking around this room right here and some couples, some people that you have, you have friends who do not know Jesus. Do not hesitate to share Jesus with them, what he's done for you. Don't just shortchange it and talk about God. No, God gave him a name. His name is Jesus. And he gave him the name that is above every other name, the only name in which salvation is found. And the clock is ticking. And we should be a generation unashamed to talk about the saving grace of Jesus. Can I get an amen, somebody? It, it, could, it, could, it could be the difference between them being with you caught up in the air and them being left here in that great and terrible day. Jesus wants us to be with him forever. He wants to deliver us from the judgment of his coming wrath. And, and, and I want to say this too as we get ready to close. Like, Jesus is returning, but he's not coming again to wash feet and turn the other cheek. He's not. This is why when we worship, we exalt. He is, listen, he is majestic. And, and I believe there's a generation of those who have, we love Jesus in the Bible, right? Walking around in the dirt, sometimes getting pushed around, but staying faithful, carrying the cross for us. But, but we don't exalt the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who is on the throne forever and ever, and who is not coming again to wash feet and turn the other cheek. He's coming with all of heaven, and heaven's wrath is going to follow him. He's worthy of our worship, Amen. He's worthy of our time today. He's worthy of your Sunday. Come on. <laughs> if he's worthy for all eternity, he's worth 52 days out of my year. Here's how he's returning. Look at this, Revelation 6. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth. Now, this is the final judgment. The whole moon turned blood red. The, sky, the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, everyone else, both slave and free, they hid in caves and the rocks of the mountains and they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. Whatever you do, just hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, watch this, and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? And I just wanna say this with, with, with great humility and submission of heart, that those who reject the love of the Lamb will receive the wrath of the Lamb. And you say, well, how could a loving God do that? The gospel is already being spread through the whole earth. The rapture will happen. During that tribulation, there will be the gathering of the elect. There will be a great awakening on the earth. There will be another opportunity. And even after that, there will be one final opportunity as this angel proclaims the gospel throughout the whole earth. Listen, God is not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to a saving relationship with him. Do you believe this about your Savior, about God? He is a loving Father, and he does not want his children going down in this burning building. God, has, in fact, I'll say this. God has not willed to show anyone his punishment. Instead, he wills to show everyone his patience. I just want to close with this. Can we all stand together? Just, we're going to close. We're just going to honor the reading of God's word. And if it wouldn't shuffle around too much, how many of you received something today? Amen? If, and I hope you find comfort in this. So I, I just want to close this reading from 2 Peter chapter 3. And here's what he said. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, watch this. Scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, follow, following their own simple desires. And they'll say, where is this promise of his coming? 
Let's skip down a few verses. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. When will the rapture occur? Uh, hey, listen, I don't know. It could happen in the next five decades. It could happen in the next five weeks. It could happen in the next five minutes. We simply do not know. But what we are to hear today and what we can be certain of right now is that we don't have to live ignorant. We don't have to be troubled for these things, but we can have peace and we can comfort one another with what Jesus wants for us, which is what? He wants us to be with him forever. And I don't know about you, but I'm hopeful that even if it came in the next five minutes, we would go to meet him in the sky. Come on. Come on. If you're hopeful that we could go and meet him one day, let's just give him a shout today. And, and I, I want to close. I want to close like this. If you bow your head with me, and if you're watching online, listen, it's not a game. It's not a silly text that you put all this stuff together and make people feel fear and trembling. I want to tell you, there's a loving God who is trying to rescue you from the sin that is trying to destroy you. And if you have not confessed him as Lord and Savior of your life, he wants to rescue you today. He, he wants to take you out of the doubt, out of the cynicism, out of the sinfulness, out of the uncertainty and he wants you today to take the first step to being with him forever and ever. He, you, listen, we have a God who loves you. And you say, well, I haven't behaved like a son or a daughter. It doesn't matter. He already loves you as if you are one. But you got to put your trust in him. If that's you today, every head about every eye closed, I just, you know, you know, the Holy Spirit's already speaking to you. Whether you're watching online or here today, you just say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my heart to you. Save me from my sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I just tell him, thank you for saving me. Thank you, Lord. I want you to be the leader of my life. Come on, I, I pray that every day. Just make that personal, church. Jesus, I want you to be the leader of my life. Lord of my life. If you prayed that prayer today, the next step for you is water baptism, getting involved maybe in one of these groups, walking this out, sharing your faith with someone in what Jesus has done for you. Church, I'm so thankful for you this weekend. I'm so thankful that we got to go through this text together to find hope and comfort in a time where there's so much unrest in our world and to know that we can have soul rest. God has a plan for it, amen. Come on, let's just give him praise today and thank him for his goodness, amen.